Good afternoon. It is Wednesday, and it's about 1.50 in the afternoon, and I have rejoined the world of the living. So, uh, as promised, a little short video that kind of explains what you're looking at when you look at these uh, PowerPoint slides. And there will be just a short little quiz on Monday, just so I know that you actually took a few minutes to watch this video. I'm going to keep it short and simple for you, um, and let's just get into it real quick. Okay. First thing I want to talk about is business and economy. And one of the big thing that's that's going on in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is this idea of social Darwinism. This is not that long after Charles Darwin has come up with the theory of evolution and survival of the fittest. And there was this idea that was going around that the poor people were poor because they had a fundamental flaw with their character. And that society would not evolve and society would not get better unless these poor people died off. That sounds harsh, but it was an actual, real thing that was going on. And there are two big proponents of this. There's a guy named William Graham Sumner and another one named Herbert Spencer. Uh, one was a student, one was the teacher. Uh, Herbert Spencer is the one who says that the poor are unfit for survival and that we should let nature eliminate them. Basically, if somebody's poor, don't help them. Let them die. Uh, William Graham Sumner takes a step further and says that if you help these people, you are suspending the progress of civilization. Other people really pick up on this. Uh, there's this guy named Reverend Josiah Strong who is going to use the social Darwinism for uh, racial reasons. Teddy Roosevelt uses it for racial reasons and his opinion of Native Americans. And um, this becomes a very prevalent way of thinking during the late 1800s. Um, because of this idea of social Darwinism, uh, government assistance for everyday people, it really doesn't exist. And because the government really didn't worry about you as an individual, it was really just worried about how much money can we make and how can we make businesses, um, you know, profitable. So, some of the things the government does instead of helping you as an individual is they raise tariffs. If you raise tariffs, tariff is a tax on imported goods. Nobody's going to buy foreign items, American industry is going to boom. Subsidies are going to be granted to business and subsidies are going to be given to railroads. Basically, the government's going to give money to businesses, no questions asked. Uh, you got the Homestead Act that gives land to settlers. Uh, if you controlled land for a certain amount of time and improved it, then you got that land for free. But the Homestead Act never actually says what improvement is. So there are some cases of people being given land putting up a fence and putting like a dollhouse on it and saying, look, I improved it. They just made money off of it. The Morrill Act gave land to colleges. And you might think, wait, that sounds like it's helping the individual people. It's really not. Because what would happen is people uh, who are wealthy, they would dump money into these land grant colleges and use it as a tax write-off. The legal system overall pro-business. They don't care about you. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, fellow servant rule, contributory negligence, the assumption of risk, foreseeability, employment contracts are enforced, and then the idea of buyer beware. Uh, just to simplify this for you, um, if you're hurt on the job, you cannot sue your employer. Uh, if you are at the least bit responsible for your injury, then the company is completely off the hook. It's 100% your fault. And if you are doing a dangerous job, then you're assuming the risk. You've, ex you've assumed the liability. And then last but not least, an injury has to be foreseen before it be compensated for. In other words, acts of God or just acts of natural disaster, legal legal's not going to cover you. Somewhat closely related to this is the gospel of wealth. Uh, this was an article written originally by Andrew Carnegie, who is one of the richest men to ever live, and he did this in 1889. And Carnegie, he believed it was the responsibility of the rich to help the poor, but not help the poor directly. So what Andrew Carnegie would do, Andrew Carnegie 
would give money to libraries and he would build uh, opera houses and things like that and he would build museums and concert halls and then he would encourage other wealthy people to do the same thing so you're not giving money to the poor because the poor um, they don't need to be helped directly but you are giving money to things that could cultivate better habits as it says here uh, here are some examples um, some other examples I should say Russell Conwell who's the founder of Temple University he said it's the duty of a good Christian to get rich and that people are poor because God is punishing them and so what Russell Conwell wanted people to do was give money to the church because then the church would help people yet really he just pocketed a lot of money uh, Dewitt Talmadge he actually refused to preach to the poor and yes this is an actual quote if you are going to kill the church thus with bad smells I will have nothing to do with this type of evangelization so this is an idea of gospel of wealth yes they were going to kind of sort of help the poor but they're still not going to help the poor directly um, because social Darwinism says don't do that not everybody is a fan of this uh, here are some names of people who are against gospel of wealth and believed in helping people directly uh, Henry George 1879 he proposed redistributing wealth he also said we need to have a flat tax as well Mark Twain wrote poor little Stephen Gerard except maybe he didn't um, there's evidence that it wasn't Mark Twain that wrote this short story that it was actually John Beach and, but whoever wrote it and poor little Stephen Gerard that whole rags to rich idea it's they're gonna say it's complete myth you cannot go from nothing and make something of yourself you have to have a start or you have to have help uh, Edward Bellamy uh, he wrote a book called looking backwards and that was published in 1888 and in his story his guy falls asleep his main character falls asleep in the year 1888 wakes up in the year 2000 and what he finds is that the United States has solved poverty and that the United States government runs a centralized economy that sounds a little bit like socialism but that was the idea and then finally a true socialist Karl Marx he writes a book in 1867 called Das Kapital um, you can think of it like the sequel to the Communist Manifesto and he argues that the whole reason you have to work is so that your labor can be exploited so these are people who are saying that businesses are just taking advantage of you and that's what a business is trying to do get as much out of you without returning anything to you there's some antitrust legislation so the government does get involved a little bit uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed by John Sherman who's actually the brother of William T. Sherman, the famous general. And what the Sherman Antitrust Act does is it prevents anti-competitive uh, agreements, it prohibits attempts to monopolize a, a market, and it authorizes people to sue in court. And basically it's going to outlaw trusts. The problem is a lot of these things go undefined. So it, while some court cases are brought to you know the Supreme Court or whatever it's very hard to win them because there's not a lot of teeth to this bite uh, one example 1895 US Supreme Court case uh, the United States versus the EC Knight company uh, there's a sugar manufacturer in Louisiana they controlled like 95 plus percent of all sugar refining in the United States and the United States is going to rule that sugar refining is manufacturing it's not interstate commerce and because it's strictly a manufacturing company the whole Sherman Antitrust Act does not apply never mind the fact that this is the one company that made 95 percent of the sugar in the United States and shipped it all over the country they were able to argue look we just manufacture it and put it on on trucks and we can't control where it goes after that what was going on with the everyday people well you would start to recognize where we are today you, know, you would probably be uncomfortable because you don't have all the modern conveniences but you would be able to walk around New York City and say okay I understand um, some of the big things that are gonna happen in this same time period uh, distinct districts 
If you think about it, every city has a residential district, every city has an industrial complex, every city has a commercial district where you buy and sell the stuff. That's a creation in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Mass transit. Uh, while Atlanta doesn't have the best mass transit system, we do have one. But the idea of mass transit starts in the late 1800s, early 1900s in places like New York, Boston, Chicago. Urban sprawl. Um, Douglasville is a great example of this. Um, you may or may not realize this, but uh, Thornton Road is part of the Douglasville city limits. The suburbs start to just grow, and the people who are moving into these suburbs are middle to upper class people. And wherever these middle to upper class people move because they've got the money, businesses start to go. And slowly but surely, the large cities are going to empty out of upper and middle class people, leaving only the poorest of the poor to live in the cities. Some cities gain importance. Uh, New York City, for example, uh, while it was always an important city, it ends up becoming the most important city in the country. And a lot of times the remaining poor city population are going to be the people who work in the factories because they'll work for the lowest amount of money. All right, migration. Cities are going to grow through this idea of migration. There's internal migration, and then there's immigration from other countries. Um, so with this rural to urban migration, people stop farming, people stop living in small cities, and they move into the larger cities. You also have uh, black migration from the south going to the north and the west. Um, even though migration, like internal migration, it's a big deal, it pales in comparison to immigration. I got some numbers here for you, um, and I wish we were in class because I'd write a whole bunch of stuff on the board just to show you this. But in, from 1865 to 1900, um, the United States sees a total of about 13 and a half million immigrants. From 1901 to 1910, just that 10 year period, there are 10 million immigrants there alone. And where they come from changes, uh, where in the early 1860s, it was primarily people from Ireland and Britain. By 1910, you have people from Eastern and Southern Europe coming. So it's a different collection of people who are coming too. A lot of the first generation immigrants, they try to bring their old way of life with them and their children really try to assimilate into American culture. And so there's a lot of clash, not just between the people who lived here and the new people, but also just generations. If you come here with your parents, you're going to view life differently than what your parents do. What was it like to live in the cities? Well, you see it here. Uh, there's a lot of crime, a lot of violence, a lot of poverty. Um, people are still going to move into the cities and they're still going to immigrate because they are promised this idea of mobility. Uh, if you work hard, you can get promoted. If you work hard, you can buy a house. And if you work hard, you'll be accepted into the fabric of America. Um, but ultimately, there's housing problems. This is a time period before the idea of the skyscraper. So just imagine New York City with buildings that are three to four stories tall because that's all you could really build. And there's there's not enough houses for everybody. So you have entire families living in like one room flats and things like that. All right, what about everyday life though? Uh, believe it or not, even though there's a lot of poverty, um, you're making more money than you have ever, ever had before. Problem is, the cost of living is going up even faster. And so you start to take on second jobs so you can afford to live. Or you rent out a room. Maybe you've got a three-bedroom apartment. You start cramming your family into two bedrooms and rent that third one to a stranger. Uh, convenience. We get canned food for the first time. We get refrigeration for the first time. We can go to the store and buy our clothes for the first time. Um, grocery stores, like we think of today, develop. I believe it's Piggly Wiggly was the first true grocery store where you could go and get your own groceries. Before that, you brought a list of groceries to the desk and they went and got them for you. And then um, the last thing on here is this family life becomes nuclear. If you're not familiar with what that means, a nuclear family is the immediate family, the parents and the children. 
there was a point in time we had extended family living, like aunts, uncles, grandparents, uh, grandchildren, all living together. But by the time we get to the 1900s, it's so expensive to live that you ba you put grandma out on the street, basically, and you replace her with somebody who's willing to pay for that room. Popular entertainment. This isn't much different than today. Um, because you have more time for leisure, you end up finding things to do. So, uh, baseball, football, basketball, sports. Circuses were a big deal. Uh, theater. And notice it's an R-E instead of an E-R. So we're still talking like stage theater. Uh, everybody enjoyed Shakespeare, for example. And eventually when movies are developed and created, movies are a huge hit and movies sell out. There's this nationwide advertising. Uh, you find nationwide advertising in pamphlets, in magazines, in um, public transportation. And so slowly but surely, uh, the regional differences that the United States have start to break down until today. I mean, you can be in Atlanta, Georgia, or uh, Augusta, Maine, and you're going to see many of the same things on TV. Or if you listen to accents, uh, all around the country, news reporters have the same accent. So um, our world gets a little bit smaller because everybody's doing the same things. Everybody's listening to the same entertainment or reading the same things. All right, what was life like specifically in the South? Um, probably know this from like Georgia history or something like that, but after the Civil War, the South is completely wrecked. The majority of the fighting happens in the South. The Union armies are going to purposely destroy the Southern economy. So when the war's over, there's really there's no roads, there's no factories, there's no mills, there's no railroads, there's no money. Education system, very, very weak and old. So after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, after, a lot of the economy that is rebuilt is controlled by northern businesses. You end up with sharecropping, where um, the owner of a plantation or, the, or a large farm may rent out some of their land in exchange for um, you know, a cut of the, the um, profits, which, by the way, very rarely happened. Extractive industries, if you think of Georgia, there's a lot of mining in Georgia. There's a lot of um, trees that are cut down in Georgia. That's an example of extractive industry. And then textile mills. Uh, Carrollton, Noonan, Bremen, LaGrange, basically all of West Georgia was heavily into this idea of textile mills. A big part of uh, the South after the Civil War, of course, is Jim Crow and segregation. This is not an overnight thing. Uh, very shortly after the Civil War, like 1866, 1867, 1868, there were these laws put in place called Black Codes. And black codes made it illegal for African Americans to own property, made it illegal for them to um, you know, own businesses or even congregate in large numbers. That is going to develop into this idea of Jim Crow in the 1870s and 1880s. And the first real sign of Jim Crow comes with voting. Excuse me. And you really see this idea when it comes to poll taxes and literacy tests. Um, since uh, how do I say this? Um, so everybody was expected to pay a tax when they went to vote. And if you couldn't pay the tax, you couldn't vote. Or everybody was expected to read a passage that was extremely difficult to read before they could vote. Problem is most blacks and poor whites couldn't have, they couldn't read and they didn't have the money. So the southern states came up with this idea called the grandfather clause. If your grandparent could vote, you could vote. That meant that the poorest of poor whites 
or the most illiterate of illiterate whites could still vote because their grandparents could all vote. Uh, blacks, though, their grandparents weren't considered citizens even if they were free. So no voting was allowed for blacks. Um, there are going to be some schools, and these schools are going to be segregated. Ironically, the first case of school segregation is in Massachusetts, of all places. Uh, railroads will be segregated first in Pennsylvania. So a lot of this idea of segregation starts in the north, but when the south realizes they can get away with it, they put hard laws in place that dictate the separations of African Americans and whites. Now there are some differing views on race relations. I know this is getting long, we're almost done, and thank you for watching up to this point. We're about 21 minutes. Um, this is specifically to the south, and this is specifically like views that were in the white community at the time. Uh, what we call today the liberal view was strongest in the 1880s. And this liberal view is still living on this idea of, you know, the, the slaves have recently been freed. We don't know what African Americans can do. And those who believe in this liberal view, they want to assimilate black people into mainstream white American culture. Uh, the radical view kind of takes over after that in the late 1880s going into the 1890s. And it's almost like the glow of um, abolition wears off. And people start to say, you know what, blacks have no place in America. And that emancipation was the worst thing ever to happen. And the way that you controlled the former slave was through lynching. Finally, in the 1890s, what's known today as the conservative view takes over. And let's find a way to control African-American society. And so the, the typical idea of, of people remaining separate that lasts all the way up until the 1950s and 60s is going to grow out of this conservative view that takes place in the late 1890s. And so for the next 50 to 60 years, the southern view on race relations is going to be pretty static actually and stay the same. All right, I'm going to skip this video here and let's talk just for a moment about the KKK. There have actually been multiple instances of the Ku Klux Klan. The first one occurred right after the Civil War and it was led by a general from Tennessee named uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. That first instance of the KKK dies out in the early 1870s. However, in November of 1915, the second coming of the KKK happens, and it is founded on Stone Mountain. In 1915, there is this movie called Birth of a Nation that's directed by D.W. Griffith, and it's kind of based on this idea of what if the South had won the Civil War. And the KKK, um, they call for, um, you know, the eradication of not just blacks, but also Catholics, Jews, and immigrants. And the white hood, the white robe, the cross burnings that are very often associated with the KKK, they are a creation of the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, November 1915, when this second KKK begins, a cross is burned on top of Stone Mountain that could be seen from downtown Atlanta. And then finally, last but not least, even in black society, there are some differences of opinions. And two of the four most popular thinkers of the day were Bush, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Booker T. Washington, he believed that blacks and whites can learn to live together and that education is going to lead to equality. And as a result, Booker T. Washington is going to create the Tuskegee Institute. It's actually not that far from here. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, he, th he believed that um, equality needs to be taken by force, basically. That blacks should argue and demand immediate equality and an immediate end to racial discrimination. Booker T. Washington, his... His view still continues with the Tuskegee Institute, 
W.E.B. Dubois, his views still exist today with the NAACP. Uh, both of these two gentlemen together are going to further uh, African-American culture um, by leaps and bounds compared to where they were beforehand. All right, 25 minutes. Get through it all. And then when we meet in class on Monday, there'll be a short little quiz just so I know that you, you watch this and it will be super easy, I promise. All right, thank you for your time. We'll see you.